Thank you very much. Please be, please remain standing, please. Now it's the time to uh, garland the photograph of uh, Dr. Engineer DJ Vimla Surendra. I can kindly invite President elect Engineer KPIU Dharmapala to garland the photograph. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Now I invite Engineer KPIU Dharmapala, President elect, Engineer Rohan Senagratna, the speaker today, and Engineer Tamil Ledirimuni, the Chairman, Electrical, Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering Section Committee, to the stage. To start with, I cordially invite Jina KPIU Dharmapala, President elect, to deliver the welcome speech. Over to you. Good evening, everybody. When uh, Professor Sarat Abekon requested me to deliver this uh, welcome speech for engineer DJ Nicholas Vendra. Normally, it is organized by the Electrical, Electronics and Telecommunication Sectional Committee of the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka. One thought, one thought, uh, part of a poem in Sinhala, written by Kalashuri Arisen Arisen Ahabudu, came into my mind. It says, Hadda Pitisara Ma Upan Gama Viduli Eliyan Eliya Karan Nata Pahan Khanu Pela Nagi Ena Vita Hadisiye Sihuna Uba Mata Naganame Pahan Kanu, Veda Uba Samarum Tam Adisiye Sehuna Uba Mata Naganame Pahan Kanu, Veda Uba Samarum Tam. Dear friends, this thought came to the mind of Kalashuri Adisan Nahabudu, must be he's from a remote village where they don't have much facilities. But when he observed this, incident, people are erecting this lamp post to provide electricity for his village. He remembered who were the pioneers for this uh, activity. So what I want to say is, now daily when we are passing through or walking through roads, or driving, we saw so many things, not even electric poles or high tension lines or uh, low tension or so many other things. But how many of us paying an attention, who discovered these things, what are the troubles they have suffered, how they suffered to uh, find out the, uh, the outcome of that uh, particular thing. So, I am leaving the answer to you. So, dear friends, it is my pleasure to welcome all participants here today for the engineer DJ Vimnasuri in the memorial oration. First, I start with our resource person, engineer Rohan Senaviratna, 
Additional General Manager Distribution Division 4 of the Ceylon Electricity Board. Chairman Electrical, Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering Sectional Committee, Engineer Chamil Yedirimuni. Then Engineer Neil Abesekara, Executive Secretary, Chief Executive Officer of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. Family members and relatives of the late engineer BJ Vimla Surendra, past presidents, council members, members of the IESL, other invitees, ladies and gentlemen. Devapura Jayasayana Vimla Surendra was born in 17 September 1874, 146 years ago, in Gaul, a Sri Lankan engineer and a statesman. He played a prominent role in the establishment of hydropower in Sri Lanka, and he is known as the father of hydropower and was a member of the State Council of Ceylon. He received his education at Ananda College, Colombo, and joined the Ceylon Technical College in 1893 while working as an apprentice at the garment factory. He graduated in Ceylon engineering. Uh, he graduated in civil engineering from the Ceylon Technical College and gained associate membership of the Institute of Civil Engineers, UK. In 1912, Engineer Vimal attended Faraday House in Stephen H, England, specializing in electrical engineering and gaining the Faraday House diploma in seven months. Also, he gained the associate membership of the Institute of Institution of Electrical Engineers, UK. In 1896, he joined the Public Works Department as a field overseer and was promoted to, the, to an inspector level within four years. Having become a junior assistant engineer by 1900, he worked on building the concentration camp in Dietalava for war prisoners. There he met a French engineer named as Ian Van. Both later came very close friends. By this time, engineer Vimla Surendra has he had his initial proposal on hydropower which was submitted to Engineering Association of Ceylon, which was ignored by the association. The friendship gradually led to discussing various matters, mainly regarding engineering aspects. Dutch engineer Ian, who had seen the Muskeli Oya and uh, Kehelgamu Oya water running waste, to feed Kalaniganga, serving no purpose. He threw up the idea to Vimala Surayendra to harness the water potential to generate hydropower in Sri Lanka. In 1913, India Vimala Surayendra gave his thoughts in the construction of a small hydropower station at Blackpool between Nanuoya and Noralia to supply electricity to Noralia town. In 1918, he submitted the paper to the Engineering Association of Ceylon again, titled Economic of Hydraulic Hydropower Utilization in Ceylon. Economic of Hydraulic Power Utilization in Ceylon. In it, he proposed Kehelgamu oil and Maskali oil, how to generate the hydropower. He estimated that the water potential combined with Maskali oil and Kehelgamu oil could be diverted to produce electricity of lights, 100,000 lamps. That is approximately 115 megawatts. He also introduced the concept of developing a national grid. Hence, this 100,000 lamps, Laksa Pahana, later very easily pronounced as now Laksha Pahana. Finally, in 1923, colonial government 
decided to go ahead with the production of hydropower and the BWD was entrusted, at, entrusted with the work. But they kept numerous women away from the participation from the project. In 1926, he was appointed as a chief engineer of the PWD. His first action was to separate the electrical section of the PWD. The Kalamu electrical scheme established in 1918 was taken over by the government to supply power to Colombo city and tramways. In 1927, he became the deputy director of newly formed Department of Government Electrical Undertaking called as DGEU. In 1929, the first thermal power station was opened in Peta, known as, known as Stanley Powerhouse. He retired from the service in 1929 at the age of 55. Thereafter, he entered into politics. He was elected to the Pal uh, Ratnapura seat, elected from the Ratnapura seat to the state council in 1931 and remained there as a member for four and a half years. Because his engineering background, he was appointed to the executive committee of works and communication, where he contributed immensely to the development of the country. He argued his case for the resumption of work of hydropower scheme left uncompleted by British administration and got reactivated. Accordingly, the Lakshapana hydropower scheme, the construction of which started in while strengthening the economy in 1924 was thus resumed in 1938 and done to the finish in 1950, paving the way for many hydropower schemes that eventually made Ceylon self-sufficient to a certain extent in electricity. I think you all know about the layout, normally the layout of this uh, uh, location where Maskelioya, where Kehilgomoya, where Castlery, and where uh, they are tapping water from Castlery and uh, then there is the DJ Vimas over in the power house. On the other side, uh, this, uh, what I would call uh, Lakshapana is there, New Lakshapana, Old Lakshapana, Canyon, various, various power houses are there. All these things are in this uh, Lakshapana complex. So now ultimately now, I think the last stage is the Broadlands power project. It is uh, down the um, old video. When he died in 10th August 1953, he was the he was at least happy that his dream has become a reality. In regards to the progress made by the util utilization of hydropower, credit must go to engineer Vimala Suhendra who pioneered to the achieve of this object. The Vimila Surendra Power House at Lakshapana as a monument to the great contribution made by this national hero. In this stage, I want to remember a serious tragedy occurred during the major flood in 1947, when a good number of workmen trapped inside the tunnel conveying water this workman died a monument with the statement saying that let us remember you who lost your sight that we might see the light let us remember you who lost your sight that we might see the light uh, see the light the signal translation is ape nuan aluwan wanu sandaha obe Nuan Sadahatama Alum Karagat Obasi Karun. Ape Nuan, Ape the S. Alukarnu Sandaha means Alokamat Karun Sandaha. Tamage Nek Sadahatama Piagat Oba Apisi Karamu. With that conclusion, once again I warmly welcome you all. I wish you thanks for you all being here. 
with us today for gracing this occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Father. Let me introduce our uh, speaker today, Engineer Rohan Seneratna. Engineer Rohan Seneratna is a chartered electrical engineer with over 30 years of experience in the field of engineering and technology. He is a fellow member of Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, Institution of Engineering and Technology UK, and a member of Engineers Australia. He is an alumnus of University of Morotua and obtained his electrical engineering degree in year 1986. He also earned his Master of Business Administration degree and the Postgraduate Diploma in Computer Technology from University of Colombo and the Postgraduate Diploma in Electric Power Distribution Systems from University of Trondheim, Norway. He joined CB in the year 1986 as an electrical engineer and served in many divisions of the CEB in different capacities and at present he serves as the additional general manager distribution division 4 of the CEB. He also functions as the project director of the enterprise resource planning project of CEB and chair the project committee of the deployment of LNG for the power sector in Sri Lanka. During his engineering career he served as the additional secretary technical of Ministry of Defense and Urban Development for five years period where he headed the technical division of the Ministry of Defense. He also served as the project director of the Metro Colombo Urban Development Project, Metro Colombo Solid Waste Management Project, director of Lanka Electricity Company Limited, Urban Development Authority and Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation. He is an active member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology and served as the chairman of the IET Sri Lanka Network and as a member of the South Asia Communities Committee of the IET. Now I cordially invite Engineer Rohan Senevratna. Good evening to all of you. President elect IESL, Chairman of Electrical Engineering Sectional Committee, members of the Council, past presidents of, and the CEO of IESL, relatives of Mr. DJ Vimala Surendra, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure and privilege to deliver the prestigious DJ Vimala Surendra oration today in front of this August gathering. As we all know, electricity is a basic need of the modern day society. Government of Sri Lanka is now in a position to satisfy this basic need to all households in this country at an affordable price, mainly due to a person who lived during the first half of 20th century. This person is none other than Mr. DJ Vimala Surendra, who is the father of hydropower in Sri Lanka. He initiated the first mini hydropower plant in Sri Lanka in 1912 at Blackpool, New Arabia. In a paper published by him in 1918, he highlighted that the harnessing of waters of Kehelgum Oya and Muskeli Oya for hydropower development would inaugurate the industrial era of this country. His dream came through in the year 1950 when the Lakshapana hydropower complex was successfully completed. 70 years passed by and during this period, successive Sri Lankan governments tapped almost all the hydro potential in Sri Lanka. The hydropower generation today is about 30% of the total electrical energy generation in the country and CB is the biggest beneficiary of hydropower development in the country. CB is indebted to Mr. DJ Vimalasurendra for his invaluable service to the hydropower development in the country 
and every year on 17th September, CEB, Comrade DJ Vimal Surendra in all officers in the CEB. When I was invited to deliver the prestigious DJ Vimal Surendra oration this year, I was wondering about the theme for my oration. I thought I should speak something close to my heart, something related to Mr. D.G. Vimala Surendra, and also something interested to the public and the audience. So giving due concern to all these things, I thought I should talk about the theme reimagining Ceylon Electricity Board for the future. I, work, I have been working for CEB 34 years as an electrical engineer. So CEB is close to my heart. CEB is very close to Mr. DJ Vimala Surendra as well. And CEB is very much in news these days and the public wanted to know more about CEB nowadays. So I think by selecting this particular theme, I have fulfilled all my three ambitions. As many of you are aware, CEB has commemorated 50th, CEB has commemorated 50th anniversary. CEB was formed in 1969, 1st of November. And for last year, that is 2019, 1st of November, we commemorated 50 years. It's a long journey, it's five decades. And during that long five decades service, CEB managed to electrify this country. CEB served for the public, CEB served for the community by providing electricity to almost all citizens of this country. When we look at the power sector and the development of the power sector from the beginning. The honorable ministers that took the helm in taking over the power and energy portfolio are depicted in this particular photograph. There are quite many very elegant ministers held the position of power and energy. At least two gentlemen are electrical engineers and fellows of this institution. The chairmen of Ceylon Electricity Board who led this institution, who made policies for the development of this institution are depicted in this particular photograph. There are quite a number of electrical engineers who led the Ceylon Electricity Board as chairman and many of them are fellows of this institution of engineers. Ceylon Electricity Board, the CEO, CEO plays the biggest role in Ceylon Electricity Board. He is the general manager of the institution and who take care of most important functions of this particular organization. So this is this photo, uh, photograph or this slide Nipit you, the general managers of the CEB from 1969 up to now. All these gentlemen are electrical engineers and most probably fellows of this institution. When we look at the development of this country in the power sector, it is very important to look at how the electrification took place in this country. If you go to 1977, the electrification level of this country was 10%. And from 1977 onwards, the CEB managed to electrify the whole country. So in the year 2019, we managed to electrify the whole country by reaching 100% electrification, which is a remarkable achievement by the by all the employees of the Ceylon Electricity Board. In the year 1977, there were just mere 126,000 
customers in CEB. And now Ceylon Electricity Board has 6.5 million customers. So we serve to each and every family of this country. The energy sold, that's also mere 1,000 gigawatt hours in 1977. And now it has reached to 14,600 gigawatt hours in the year 2019. The maximum demand, which was mere 261 megawatts in 1977, it grew over the period of time. And now the maximum demand reporting is about 2,668 megawatts in the year 2019. Over this period of time, we managed to build large number of power stations. There are CEB owned power stations and as well as private sector owned power stations. There are 282 power stations in the country now, total to the install capacity of 4,217. So there are about 139,399 megawatt capacity owned, 17 power plants owned by the CEB. Plants, there are thermal power plants and there is a coal power plant as well. When we look at the small power plants, those small mini hydro, wind power, solar power, and the dendro power, almost all these power plants are owned by the private sector. And, and they also give a better service to us by feeding their energy to the national grid. So the Mahavali complex is one of the largest complexes, the hydropower complexes of the CEB. The Victoria, Kotmale, Upper Kotmale, Randenigala, Rantambe, Ukuela, both and Nilambe all consist in the Mahavali complex. And the Lakshapana complex is the oldest complex with old Lakshapana, new Lakshapana, Samana, Levi, Malasuri, and so on. The Samanalabava complex, which is reasonably new and modern, are the Samanalabava, Kukule Ganga, and so on. So in addition to that, CEB owned quite a number of thermal power plants in Kalnitis, uh, Sapugaskanda, and Norochole. This is our largest power plant, the 900 megawatt Norochole Lakwijaya power plant. Along this journey, we invited private sector to take part in the power generation. So there, ha there have been so many IPP, independent power projects connected with our national grid. So this journey started about 23 years ago. Now we have at least five, six large scale independent power producers who produce power and sell it to the CEB. There are short, small power plants. Those are basically mini hydro, wind and solar power plants. The installed capacity of the CEB along with the private power plant is now about 4,200. When you look at this graph, you can see that from 2015 onwards, it is flat. So that shows that from 2015 onwards, the government of Sri Lanka could not build a single large power plant. So the installed capacity more or less remains same. When you look at the generation by ownership, in the year 2019, CEB generated 71% of the electrical energy of the country. And 29% came from the private sector. Those are independent power projects. Along this journey, CEB managed to integrate large quantities of renewable energy to our grid. In the year 2018, 45% of our electrical energy generation was from renewable sources. And in the year 2019, it is 35% due to dry weather conditions prevail in the country. But the renewable uh, portfolio, the energy generate from renewable power sources generally in between 30 to uh, 45 to 50% generally. We have 148 megawatt wind power plants now, 410 megawatts mini hydro, and 24,000 connections of roof solar, and 71 megawatts of large solar and 1,399 megawatts of major hydro, total into 2,261 megawatt of renewable power in this country. So that is about 54% of the 
total installed capacity of the country. The revenue from build sales was just 2.7 billion in 1983, and now it is about 240 billion rupees. So in that way, Ceylon Electricity Board is one of the largest organizations in the country. Our system losses was about 21% some time ago, and we managed to bring it down to 8.23%. That is one of the most remarkable achievements of the CEB. This is generation loss, transmission loss, and the distribution loss. This is technical loss plus non-technical loss together. So 8.23 losses is remarkable. If you compare with any other country in the region, we are the best. Even if we compare with other European countries, 8.23% of losses, including generation, transmission, and distribution is remarkable. We expanded the transmission and distribution network throughout the country. So much so that we have about 150,000 kilometers of low voltage lines in the country now and about 35,000 kilometers of medium voltage lines and 3,000 kilometers of high voltage lines. Our transmission network expanded throughout the country, covering north to south and east to west. We have about 726 kilometers of 220 kV transmission lines and about 75 grid substations and 32,000 33 kV lines and about 150,000 low voltage lines. In that expansion, we managed to cover the entire country by expanding the national grid to each and every corner of this country. The number of distribution substations is about 33,000 now. Those are small substations which provide energy to households. So it is scattered all over the country and totaling to about 33,000 now. In order to provide the customer service and to manage the distribution, we have four distribution divisions, 12 provincial officers, 64 area engineer officers, 231 customer service centers, 11 call centers, and CEB on 78 payment counters. So in that way, we are giving a possible best service to our customers. So it covers the entire country by dividing it to four divisions and one division is headed by me. So there are 64 chief engineer officers covering from Colombo city to all other parts of the country. So those are the customer interfaces and there are 231 customer service centers which covers again the country. Those are two customer service points. And for revenue collection, in the recent past, we have provided a lot of added services. Customers can make payments through credit card, CEB care application, online banking facilities, MCash, post offices, and all the banks in the country, so that customers can reach their payment counters very easily. The recently developed CEB care application, this is an in-house development by our own engineers, it manages the, the interruption management. So it is a wonderful piece of software developed by our own engineers. When you complain to the call center, then you can track the, your complaint and where the complaint is, at what stage the complaint is. And once the complaint is completed, you are again informed. And through this special CEB care application, the customers receive power interruption notices and also through this special software, they can look at their bills and how much areas in their electricity bills and they can make online payments as well. Ceylon Electricity Board gives very subsidized tariff to our domestic customers. Perhaps some of you may not believe out of the 6.5 million customers, 1.3 million customers' monthly electricity bill is less than 60 rupees. Out of the 6.5 million customers, 
1.3 million customers, monthly electricity bill is less than 60 rupees. Another 1.6 million customers, monthly electricity bill is less than 224 rupees. Another 1.4 million, it is about 732. So about 4.5 million customers of this country out of 6.5 million total customers get very reasonable subsidized electricity. So that way, Ceylon Electricity Board is doing a wonderful service for the people of this country by giving subsidized electricity. Our tariff was last changed in 2012. For the last eight years, the tariff has not changed. The only change we did was the reduction of the tariff of 2012 by 25% in 2014. At the time that uh, the North Chole power plant, power plant was commissioned. Since then, there are no changes to the tariff. But during that period, the US dollar devalued by 38%. Most of our consumer bills, including oil, are imported. So it has a huge impact on our cost devaluation of coffee. It devalued by 38%. And some of you may not be aware, CEB pays a large amount of taxes to the government. In the year 2018, Ceylon Electricity Board paid 25,000 million rupees of taxes to the government of Sri Lanka. And our selling price is now 1663, but cost per unit is 2329. So naturally, Ceylon Electricity Board is making losses. The net loss for 2019 was 85 billion rupees. That is 85,000 million rupees. And the forecasted loss for the year 2020 is 67 billion rupees. It is enormous amount, it is large amount. There are accumulated payments as well. Out of the total cost of uh, our unit cost, 71% comes from generation. Out of this 23, 29, 1652 is the generation cost. Other costs are transmission, distribution, system losses, and the corporate cost. Unless we reduce the generation cost, we cannot reduce the unit costs of the Ceylon electricity board. This is how we perform financially. In the 2014, it is 14,000 million plus, and it continued, and the last year, it was 85,000 million. There are two major reasons for this. One is the high generation cost. And second is the, the tariff. We have not changed the tariff since 2012, even though all the costs and the ecosystems around the CEB, the escalation took place. However, we have achieved great things during these five decades. Ceylon Electricity Board managed to electrify the country totally, 100% electrified by year 2019. And our generation transmission and distribution losses are 8.23. We provide 24-7 power supply to the country. Our reliability is reasonably okay. It is not the best, but we manage about 99.98 availability to our customers. And we provide subsidized tariff to low end customers. And also we provide subsidized tariff to industrial customers. We managed to absorb large quantities of renewable energy during these five, uh, five decades. It is ranging from 30% to five, uh, 50%. We encourage people to have more and more roof solar, so that now we have about 24,000 roof solar connections. And also there are about 70 megawatt ground solar power plants also in our system. So we have come a long way and we have achieved many things. We managed to provide a great service to our people, people of this country, and we have been doing good 
good work for the country. However, our stakeholders demand much more from us. The customers, they expect high customer service, much more than what we give it to them at present. And the governments and the other stakeholders wanted to have more and more renewable energy integrated to the grid and to decarbonize the power sector. And our regulator PUCSL imposed various regulatory requirements which we have to fulfill. People expect distributed generation and people also expect the Ceylon Electricity Board to be more efficient and effective. And our stakeholders expect us to reduce our technical and non-technical losses further. And people want 24 into seven power supply. They cannot afford even a small power failure nowadays. Our customers expect 24 seven power supply. And the reliability of grid has to be very high. That is what stakeholders demand. That is what our customers demand. Grid has to be flexible. We should be able to reduce the peak demand and we should be able to reduce the power purchase cost. So the stakeholders, they demand many things from us. So it is time to reimagine for the future. When we think about reimagination, we have to look at how, how it is happening in other countries and other part of the world. World is transitioning from an electricity system based primarily upon large centralized generation transmission and distribution technologies to one that also embraces distributed, digitally enhanced and low carbon technologies. Communication infrastructure is the key enabler in digital utility transformation. Looking at the trends shaping the power industry worldwide, there is a pressing need to change the business model from traditional utility to digital decarbonized and decentralized utility. The three Ds, digitized, decarbonized and decentralized utility. When we look at the utility reimagination, re we have to look at how we can transform our utility to low carbon technologies for power generation. The utilities wanted to modernize the grid to enhance reliable, to enhance reliability and to integrate large quantities of renewable energy, electric vehicles, distribution, generation, etc. And utilities wanted to provide a seamless digital customer experience to our customers and utilities wanted to excel their business through digital transformation. When we look at the new technologies for low carbon power generation, the utilities introduce liquid natural gas for power generation. The utilities wanted to construct more and more renewable power plants. The utilities wanted to promote distributed generation so when we do all these things, we have to look at appropriate energy mix for the country. When we look at the future of transmission and distribution grid, the grid should be resilient, reliable, and high power quality grid. The grid should be able to integrate large quantities of renewable energy, electric vehicles, battery storage, distributed generation, demand response schemes, demand site management. And we should be able to enable seamless digital customer experience. So the grid of the future will be a more complex grid with bi-directional flows at both consumer and local grid. Greater complexity in the distribution grid with distributed generation in place. The future grid the reimagined grid will be digital grid plus the electrical grid. It is not only hardware. Up to now, when we talk about the grid, we talk about the hardware. 
the transformers, the power lines and various other equipments. But in time to come, there will be a digital layer over this hardware layer that will play a more significant role in time to come to manage our grid. So grid will be a digital grid and the electrical grid. And the journey is to go for smart grid. Smart grid is an electricity grid with communication, automation and IT systems that enable real-time monitoring and control of bi-directional power flows and information flows from points of generation to points of consumption at the appliances level. Grid is evolving into an integrated smart grid, a unique solution which integrates all types of power generation and helps the consumer become the producer and the consumer. So in the smart grid functionalities of the transmission segment, we have to look at supervisory control and data acquisition systems, energy management systems, wide area monitoring systems, substation automation, renewable integration, demand response, and energy storage. In the distribution segment of the smart grid, once again, we have to introduce supervisory control and data acquisition systems. The data, the distribution management systems, and distribution automation, primary substation automation, advanced metering infrastructure, which is called smart metering, geographical information systems, outage management systems, distribution transfer monitoring systems, mobile crew management systems, energy storage, electrical vehicles, and so on. When we really look at our own distribution grid and our own transmission grid, we have not reached this status. We have not reached the smart grid status. We are far, far behind. So we have to reimagine our grid, the transmission grid and the distribution grid to convert both transmission and distribution grids to smart grids. When we look at the customer side of it, the customer expects from our utilities, the digital services. Customer wants to do all his transactions through his mobile phone. When we reimagine, we should be able to give that services to the customer. Customers want it to be prosumers. They want to be consumer as, all, as well as the producer, which is called the prosumer. And the customer relationship management will be vital in the reimagined utility because customer relationship management plays a wide role to manage the needs of our customers. We should be able to give innovative tariff to our customers. The reimagined customers, reimagined utility should be able to give innovative tariff to our customers. And demand response schemes are very important for the utility as well as for the customer. And the demand side management should also be promoted in this journey. And people expect electrical vehicle integration to the grid. So when we have large number of electrical vehicles in the country, definitely we have to think differently how we can serve our customers who have electric vehicles. In the business, in the business side, in the organization, in the, within the organization, in the reimagined utility, we have to do the business process re-engineering. So that is a must. What we have been doing up to now, perhaps may not be the best. We have to re-engineer our processes. We have to do the business process re-engineering. And we have to use information, communication, technology for the business management. We are far, far behind there. But many other parts of the world Many utilities use information, communication, technology for their business management. Adoption of enterprise resource planning systems is very vital in the reimagined utility. So the enterprise resource planning systems integrate all functions together and try to give integrated ICT services to each and every user of the utility. We have to think about change management. 
think about the employee engagement. So these things are very vital in the reimagined utility in their own business management. So by looking at that, that experience and how it happens in the other countries, when we want to reimagine CEB, we have to define goals for CEB, looking at how the other countries are doing, how we have come to this level, how the stakeholders demand various services from us. By giving due concern to all these aspects, we have to define future goals for the utility. So the future goals for the Ceylon Electricity Board should be as follows. One major goal is meeting future power generation capacity based on low carbon technologies and renewable energy using appropriate business models. Another important goal is the expansion and modernization of grid to enhance reliability and to integrate large quantities of renewable energy, distributed generation, et cetera. Another very important goal is to enable seamless digital customer experience. And the other, perhaps the most important thing is business excellence through digital transformation. So on the journey to give advanced services to our stakeholders to fulfill their imaginations, CEB has to work on these four goals in the future. We will see how, where are we and what is our future, whether we have initiated actions to achieve these goals. When we look at the first goal, meeting future power generation capacity based on low carbon technologies and the renewable energy using appropriate business models, first we have to look at where we are. So this is the unfortunate situation we have faced. From 2015 onwards up to now, the government of Sri Lanka could not build a single large scale power plant and connect it with our national grid. So it is a huge challenge. And this is how we generate electrical energy during the year 2019. So major hydro contribution was 24%. Mini hydro was 6%. Wind contribution was 2%. Solar PV was 2%. Biomass was 1%. And coal 34%. And the diesel and the furnace soil 32%. Total into 100%. This is how we produce electrical energy in the country in the year 2019. When we look at the world, world energy generation, it is different. The major difference is in the world scenario, there is 23% come from gas, that is natural gas and 38% come from coal, and 7% from solar PV and wind. And mind you, oil usage in the world scenario is only 3%. So I will take you back to last year's energy mix again. When we look at that, the oil usage for power generation in the year 29 was 32%. That is the killer. That is the most expensive part for the power generation. In the world scenario, it is only 3%. In the world scenario, there is 23% of natural gas usage for the power generation. In our Sri Lankan scenario in the year 2019, natural gas usage is zero. So what we should do for the future? Definitely, we have to reduce the power generation through oil, that is diesel and the furnace oil. That portion should be replaced with renewable energy and the natural gas. When we talk about this exercise, we have to have correct energy mix. The energy mix should be determined by really looking at three things. One is energy security. 
energy security is paramount important for a country. When we determine the energy mix, we have to give real emphasis to the energy security. Another very important factor is system stability. Our system, our transmission network, our distribution network should be reliable and the stable. We cannot have total power failures in our system. So we have to really look at the stability of our transmission network when we determine the energy mix. And the third is the economics of power generation and at what cost we can generate power. The customers demand, the stakeholders demand to produce electrical energy at the lowest possible cost. There is one more very important aspect that is the carbon percentage of power generation. Everybody, the government and everybody wanted to decarbonize the power sector. So when we determine the energy mix, we have to look at that fact as well. How much we can decarbonize our power sector by choosing appropriate energy mix. So our ambition, our, our plan is to have 70% of electrical energy generation in the country from clean energy sources by the year 2030. That is our intention. So let's have a look on how it happened in 2019 and what we are going to do in 2030. In the 20, year 2030, we wanted to reduce this 34% of power generation using diesel and furnace oil to 1%. And instead of that portion, we wanted to enhance the renewable portfolio to 50%. And we wanted to bring natural gas to the power sector and to have about 20% of power generation from natural gas. And coal is going to play a very vital role in the year 2030 as well. It will be about 30%. So in that scenario, we should be able to generate 70% of our electrical energy using clean energy sources. So in that way, we can decarbonize our power sector we can bring good economics to the power sector and we can bring another source for the power generation that is natural gas that way energy security will be enhanced in order to achieve this goal this energy mix we have to work hard we have to implement the least cost generation plan of ceylon electricity board we have to construct large number of renewable power plants we have to introduce liquid natural gas to the power generation. We have to promote distributed generation. We have to construct at least one more coal power plant during this period. And we have to look at the economics of power generation as well. Now let us see where we are, whether we are on track. First, we see the real, new re, renewable power additions. Now, when we look at the new renewable additions, as per the energy mix of 50% renewables for the power generation in the year 2030, we have to enhance the renewable portfolio. The major hydro is almost tapped. There is very limited more potential to have major hydro. So, by 2030, we can add only about 208 megawatts of major hydro. By 2025, we will tap all the major hydros and there won't be any major hydros left after 2025. And the mini hydro that also will be enhanced, will be tapped or used fully by 2025. There, there are only very limited number of mini hydro potential areas remain in the country. So till 2030, we, can, we may be able to add about another 163 megawatts of mini hydropower plants. And then what are the sources that are going to play a huge role in this exercise? They are wind and solar power. In order to achieve 50% renewable energy in the year 2030, 
we have to construct at least 1000 megawatts of new wind power plants in the country. We have only 148 megawatts at the moment. So during next decade, we have to construct at least 1000 megawatts of wind power plants. The other major player is the solar power. During next 10 years, we have to construct at least 1,900 megawatts of solar power plants. At present, including roof solar, we have about 350 megawatts. So adding another 1,900 megawatts of solar to the power sector during 10 years is an enormous challenge and an enormous task. Biomass also we can increase a reasonable quantity of 59. So in order to achieve this 50% target by 2030 on the renewables, we have to work very, very hard to achieve these targets. These are not easy. There are a lot of challenges in bringing wind power. There are a lot of challenges in bringing solar power. The environmental approvals and the land acquisition and the land scarcity, social issues and various other political lobbies will negate the development of renewable energy in this country. But the CEB is going to facilitate this with the support of the private sector because all future wind power plants and the solar power plant should come from the private sector. I don't think CEB is going to build any more wind power plants or solar power plants in the future. The last one most probably would be the 100 megawatt uh, wind power plant which is being constructed in MENA. So it is the opportunity for the private sector to come forward and to take these challenges and to construct large number of wind power plants and solar power plants. So there is enough capacity that we can absorb to our national grid without any problem. So it is an opportunity, opportunity for the industrialists, opportunity for the businessmen. Please come forward and construct large number of wind power plants and large number of solar power plants. And next three years, 2020, 2021, and 2022 will be remarkable for the CEB and the country in renewable additions. Perhaps the largest renewable additions in the history will take place in these three years. These are realities. 2020, 2021, and 2022. In this year, we are going to commission 100 megawatt of CEB owned MENA wind power plant. That is the largest wind power plant in the country. And mini hydro developers are going to add about 12 megawatt. The Muturaja Villa solid waste incinerator, the first such incinerator in the country, going to produce about 10 megawatts of power. And the ground mounted solar will add about 25 megawatts. And roof solar will add about 70 megawatts. And the Jaffna wind already connected is adding about 20 megawatts now. So this year alone, we are going to add about 237 megawatts of renewable energy to our national grid. And the next year, the one of the last and largest hydropower plant, the Mahawaya power plant will be connected with the grid it is 120 megawatts. And the Broadlands power plant, which is being constructed by the CEB, will be added to the grid next year. That is 35 megawatts. And there will be about 7 megawatts of mini hydro and 100 megawatts of brown mounted solar. And about 70 megawatts of roof solar will be added to the national grid next year, totaling to 332 megawatts. And 2022, there'll be additions of mini hydro and there'll be one more incinerator coming in Karadiana for solid waste management that will add about 10 megawatts and there'll be dendro plants there'll be large number of brown solar power plants and roof solar as well and the wind power plants so these three years are going to add about 940 megawatts of renewable energy into the grid our day peak is about 2,100. Our night peak is about 2,500. So when you compare with 
the day peak and the night peak, adding about 940 megawatts to our system is remarkable. The Ceylon electricity board is facilitating all these things. Perhaps many in the country think that C is negating adding of renewable energy to our grid. It is not the case. C is promoting renewable as much as possible. That is why next three years, 940 megawatts of renewable can be added to our national grid. Let's have a look on the major hydros. So these are the major hydros which uh, we are going to add to the system. In 21, Broadlands, Umawa, 23, Morogol, and 2023, Sitawaka, and 2024, Talpitigal. The Broadlands hydropower plant is 35 megawatts in capacity. It can generate about 126 million units per year. And it is being built at a cost of 15 billion rupees. So it will be commissioned somewhere in early 2021. So these are some of the pictures it's, uh, of the project and which is uh, nearing completion, the dam, the power plant, and the underground uh, works, underground tunnels, and the generators are being installed now, and the runners have come, and a lot of work is taking place in the Broadlands power plant, so which will be commissioned in early next year. And the next one is Umawaya, 120 megawatt. That is also nearing completion. The dam is almost completed and the underground tunnel is being done and the power plant is being done. It's about 90% of the work is completed. The Moragolla is to be commissioned in 2023. The initial works are now going on. Sitawaka is at planning stage. That is also about 30 megawatt power plant. And now let us have a look at wind power projects. In the wind power projects, already 20 megawatt wind power plant commissioned this year and connected with the national grid. That is CLEX, the Lanka Transformers did that 20 megawatt plant. And the 100 megawatt wind power plant, the Manawan is ongoing. And the 60 megawatt wind power projects are ongoing. And in Poonarin, there are plans to have about 300 megawatts of wind power. Poonarin and Mana are the two best places to generate wind. You can reach the plant factors more than 40%. Those are ideal locations for wind power. So there is a potential for about 300 megawatts in Poonarin and another 300 megawatts in Mana area. And these are the two plants recently commissioned by the CLEX, that is Lanka Transformers Company, each 10 megawatt each. And this is the flagship project of CEB. That is 100 megawatt wind power plant. This is financed by the Asian Development Bank, 25 billion rupee worth work and project to be completed in January 2021. So this is the Mana Island. And the Mana Island is one of the best places for wind power generation in the country. And this is how the construction work is going. And it is nearing completion now. And these are some of the pictures during the construction, how the, this large construction of 3.5 megawatt wind power plants are being done. So it's a flagship project and the unit cost of this particular project will be about eight rupees. So it will be one of the lowest unit cost through renewable power plants. So that will be an asset to the country that will be an asset to the CEB and for the people of this country. So there are quite a number of solar power projects going and roof solar is coming at a rate, at least 70 megawatts of roof solar is coming per year now. So most of the roofs and big roofs are already covered and small roofs are also being covered. So there will be a lot of opportunities for solar power projects. Already 24,000 connections given on roof solar and major solar 71 megawatts commissioned. 
and three tenders are going 60 megawatt, 90 megawatt, and the 150 megawatt tenders are going. And the prices have come down remarkably. Earlier, the solar price was 21 rupees. And because of the competition, prices have come down and the going rate is now about 10 rupees. So solar kilowatt hour can be generated for about 10 rupees per kilowatt hour. The CML Andu area, there is a potential for about 100 megawatt big solar power project. So that is also being evaluated. And a few days ago, on my recommendation, on my idea, the government took a decision to construct about 5,000 small solar power projects throughout the country. I propose it. That is to connect about 50 to 100 kilowatts to each and every transformer of this country. There are 33,000 transformers in this country. When we leave out the unfeasible ones, we can be connected about 100, 50 to 100 kilowatts of solar for about 5,000 transformers. That is without any transmission cost, without any distribution cost. What you need is a land of about uh, 40 purchase, closer to a transformer, that is about 400 meters, within 400 meters to the transformer, distribution transformer. So you can connect 100 kilowatt and connect to the transformer. So there, definitely we go to the competition and definitely we will reach prices to about 12 rupees to 13 rupees. So if we can generate a unit at the transformer level at 12 rupees and 13 rupees, it is a win-win situation. So we can create 5,000 5, entrepreneurs, the small scale entrepreneurs. They can put up these plants, which is about seven, eight million rupees. They can find a barren land of about 40 purchase. And we go for the competition. They can come with the price. And it's a simple connection and with a smart inverter. So that way, we wanted to build the entrepreneurs in this country, especially entrepreneurs in the rural sector. When I proposed this to His Excellency the President that day about a few days ago, they took it very seriously. They were really happy about this proposal and they wanted to immediately implement this. So we are going to implement this as quickly as possible. I'm going to start the first work in Hambantota area. So perhaps we can have about two, 300 small power plants in Hambantota. There's plenty of land surrounded by the transformers. Transformers are fully underutilized. So that way we can bring the entrepreneurs, the people in the village as businessmen. And there'll be a lot of job opportunities will be created for the people in these rural areas. So this way, by bringing renewable energy into the national grid, we'll create a lot of opportunities for Sri Lankan businessmen and for the people of this country. So our intention is to promote renewable energy as much as possible as per the energy mix that is 70% clean energy where 50% is from renewable because we have to look at the stability and other aspects. So we have to have the correct energy mix. So with that correct energy mix, we can absorb about 1,900 megawatts of solar during next 10 years and 1,000 megawatts of wind, which are substantial, which will create a lot of business opportunities for the people of this country. So what is the other source that we have to introduce to bring the generation cost down? That is natural gas. So we want to replace 34% of oil power generation using natural gas and the renewables. So we have to bring natural gas to the equation. Unfortunately, we don't produce natural gas for the moment. So we have to import natural gas. So when we import natural gas, we have to liquefy it. So that is called liquid natural gas. The liquid natural gas prices in the world have come down drastically in the recent years. It was about $10 per MMBTU about four years ago. And then now the Asian market prices have come down to $250 per MMBTU. If it is $250 per MMBTU, we can generate a unit 
to a combined cycle 300 megawatt power plant about approximately 12 rupees or even less. So that will be a clean source of energy. And that will definitely benefit the environment of this country. And also that will definitely benefit the finances of the Ceylon Electricity Board. So how we are going to introduce liquid natural gas to the power sector in Sri Lanka? We are going to introduce liquid natural gas to Colombo based power plants. Colombo based existing power plants will be converted to natural gas. And all new plants to be constructed in and around Colombo, especially the Kerala Pitya and the Kalnitis, uh, will be natural gas power plants. So that in future, there will be a substantial number of megawatts of power plants in Colombo will run on natural gas. So this is how we are going to add the natural gas power plants. So we can convert the existing Kerala PTA power plant, nothing to convert, it is already dual fuel. We can directly connect natural gas to that power plant. And two power plants in, in uh, Kalitis, so we have to convert to dual fuel. And all future power plants that we are going to construct in Kerala PTA, and one power plant in Kalitis uh, will be run on natural gas. That is what we envisage. So accordingly, we have to import LNG to Sri Lanka. So these are the metric tons per annum quantities. It varies depending on the weather conditions of the country. If it is a wet year, we don't want to import that much. If it is a dry year, we have to import a little more. So this is how we calculated the quantities that we require in liquid natural gas for the power generation in the country. If the price of liquid natural gas in the Asian market is $7, but I told you now it is $2.50. Even if it is $7, by introducing natural gas to the power sector, we can save 42,000 million rupees per year. If the long-term prices are $4 per MMBTU, we can save about 60,000 million rupees from power generation by introducing natural gas to our power sector. So this is one of the most important projects for the CEB and for the country. I'm heading that project. For the last one and a half years, I spent so much of my time, at least 40% of my time to bring this uh, reality. So how we did, we, we got the PWC to do the pre-visibility study because this is a new subject for us to the support of the ADB. We finished the feasibility study, then again got PWC to do the feasibility study along with our engineers. Actually only three engineers from CEB work for this project, myself and two others I'm working part-time. And we got PWC, Lanka Hydraulics and Force Technologies of Spain to do the full feasibility study. And after that, we have prepared requests or proposal documents for LNG sourcing and bringing FSRU, that is called Floating Storage Regasification Unit and the Mooring System and the Pipeline. And how we are going to do that, uh, the business model, uh, this is what the business model is. Uh, we invite private sector once again. The floating storage regasification unit is a ship which we are going to anchor or which we are going to move in Kerala Pitya five kilometers away from the coast. So that is a LNG ship. It is called floating storage regasification unit, FSRU. So FSRU has the storage capacity to store LNG at minus 160 degrees centigrade and the same ship has the regasification capacity. So both built into one ship. So that is called floating storage regasification unit. So we are going to move it off Kerala Pitya and CEB is going to do that particular project. And from there we regasify and through undersea pipeline and, oversea, and overland pipelines, we are connecting the regasified gas to Kerala PT existing power plants, future power plants, and the Calipis power plants. So these projects will be private investments. The FSRU will be, will be bringing into the country by the 
private investors. It's like independent power project. So they have to bring it, mold it, and give these services. We pay for them for the throughput. Similarly, pipeline will also be a private investment. They have to install the pipeline, we pay for the throughput, like in a private power plant. So then CEV is going to buy, buy the LNG through competition. So LNG sourcing will be on competitive basis. Those will be on short term contracts and the spot market. Spot market is the best for the moment. It is the cheapest, it is 250 for the moment, but long term contracts are a little expensive. But what we are going to is to buy LNG on competition, keeping the transparency. This is how we are going to, uh, going to have the floating storage regasification unit of Kerala Pitya. That is five kilometers away. It's a large ship which has the storage facility and the regasification facility. And this is the pipeline network. Pipeline network from the FSRU up to the landfall point and from the landfall point up to the power plants. So these projects, these three components are very vital and within a very short period of time, within a year, we managed to finish all tender documents. Now all tender documents are before the Attorney General Department for the approval now. So we are hopefully within next two weeks, we will get the approval from the Attorney General's Department after receiving that we are going to go for tenders. All these will be competitive tenders so that the transparency will be ensured and the best prices are ensured. So according to our plan, we want to, to finish this project. We want to have the FSRU mooring system and the pipeline network by the end of 2023. If everything goes right, we can have natural gas to the country in 2023 December. But there are a lot of challenges. So we have to encounter challenges and to find solutions for the challenges. That is what we are doing. But we had a lot of challenges before we embark on this journey and the halfway through. I must give the full credit to His Excellency, the President. He personally involved and ironed out all the other problems and gave the clear cabinet approval for what we want in the month of June this year. So that was enormous, enormous success of this particular project. So now it is very clear on the business model and how we are going to buy. Everything is on transparency. Everything is on competition. There are no unsolicited proposals in this business models. So we have to fight a battle to bring it to this level. Now we are going in the correct path and hopefully with the support of everybody, we can have the systems going by 2023 end. When we have natural gas, we have to have power plants as well. We have existing power plants, those can be 300 megawatt power plant in Kerala Pitya, but we have to construct more power plants. At least by 2023 end, we have to construct another two number of 300 megawatt combined cycle power plants in Kerala Pitya before the LNG arrives. So that is a must, that is a must to maintain the demand of the country meet the demand of the country and meet the reliability levels of the country. So construction of those two number of 300 megawatt combined cycle power plants are very essential. In addition to that, we have to construct 100 megawatt gas turbine in Kalnitis, which also will run on natural gas. And also we have plans to construct another 300 megawatt unit for the Lakvijay power plant in Norachori. That too want, we wanted to complete by the end of 2023. So our plan is to construct three, four major power plants. Two number of 300 megawatt power plants in Kerala Pitya, one 300 megawatt power plant in Norasholi and 100 megawatt power plant in Kalipis. If we can construct those four large power plants, then we can run most of these power plants using natural gas and the one power plant using coal power. But there are enormous challenges. The first power plant that we wanted to construct and, and run by 2020 is still under discussion. It was tendered in 2016. 
So far, the government of Sri Lanka could not award that tender. They have got a very reasonable price tender. Very, very reasonable, unimaginably low price. But still, due to various reasons, still the government of Sri Lanka could not award that tender. So that is a pathetic situation. Because we need that power plant as early as possible to avoid power cuts and avoid uh, expensive diesel power and the emergency power. But still, we are discussing on that particular power plant. And the second power plant, we should have advertised it a long time ago. But still, we are looking and reading the tender documents. So the second power plant in Kerala Pitya, which is very essential, but it is still under discussion. And the Norachole power plant, we have focused well, actually. The decisions came very recently. In the last three months, we have focused well, hopefully, we want to fast track that power plant and to complete by 2023. So there are enormous challenges in bringing large power plants to the country. So that is a huge challenge. And, that, and due to that reason, the last five years, 2015 to 2020, we could not build a single large power plant in this country. So 2021 or so, seven, eight months gone, still we could not arrive at the correct decisions to put up these power plants. So it's an enormous challenge. We are facing that challenge. So we want to somehow or other face that challenge and to award these contracts as early as possible and to start constructing these power plants. So we have hope and wish that we will have all these four power plants by the end of 2023 and the natural gas also will come to the sector by end of 2023. And also we will add enormous amount of renewables to our power system during next few years. If we can achieve all these things, if we can bring large quantities of renewable, if we can bring liquid natural gas to the equation, and if we can construct these four major power plants, we will be break even by 2024. It's simple mathematics. The CEB can be break even in the year 2024 if we can finish those few items. Those are not magics. Those are those things can be done, but could, could not do for five years. But we have to do this. So if we can focus on these areas, those critical aspects, those critical projects, and give the hundred percent support and the decisions and push hard to bring all these things by end of 2023. 2024 will be a very progressive year for the CEB and for the country. Right, now let us look how we should modernize the transmission network because only generation is not sufficient. Generation is a must, but only generation is not sufficient. Without transmission, how can we evacuate power from the future power plants? Without transmission, how we can have a stable grid? You all know we had a total power failure a few weeks ago. And when you really analyze it, it is true that it was a mistake by one employee. It is true, but when we really look at our grid, we have to do enormous amount of improvements to our national grid. So that is the final answer. So we have to modernize and we have to expand the grid to improve the reliability and to integrate large quantities of renewable energy and the distributed generation. It is true, so many transmission projects are ongoing. These projects are ongoing and finished in 2020, and these are ongoing and finished in 2021. These sets of projects will be finished in 2022. And then we have to think about how we can convert the, our transmission grid to a smart grid. Because in order, to, in order to bring more and more renewables, the grid should be smart. Without a smart grid, we cannot bring large quantities of renewable energy to the grid. Then the stability of the grid will be a problem. But if you have a smart grid with all the facilities listed here, then we can bring more and more renewable energy while keeping a very stable grid. So we have to convert our existing grid 
to a smart grid using all these scenarios. All these things should be added to our grid. So when we look at the investments that we require to improve the transmission, improve the transmission grid, it is about $1,500 million for next 10 years. That is to have transmission networks to evacuate power from new power plants, new renewable power plants, new LNG power plants, new coal power plants, and also to strengthen the transmission network to bring the stability up and also to expand the transmission network and also to convert the transmission grid to a smart grid. So we have to invest about $1,500 million for next 10 years. It is not an enormous amount also. It is about $150 million per year. If you really look at the metro project, the light rail project from Malambay to Colombo of 19 kilometers, the project cost is 2,200 million US dollars. So in that way, spending 1,500 million dollars for next 10 years to modernize the transmission with this, not that much. But unfortunately, up to now, we have not uh, found or we have not properly sought finances for these projects. There is a long list of identified projects for which there are no finances, no finance commitments. So getting finance from ADB, getting finance from World Bank and the other lending agencies is not an easy task. It takes time, negotiations will take a lot of time, a lot of environmental conditions, a lot of social conditions that we have to fulfill. So it takes time. So unless we really get together and expedite to bring money from some means to construct this transmission improvement development, we will face another problem of not having adequate transmission capacities in our grid. So we have to work hard with the agencies, with other methods. We have to introduce new business models, suppliers credit, and perhaps certain other business models like the investor of renewable energy can construct the transmission line as well. So we will pay a unit cost for the renewable developer to construct the transmission line also. It's a viable model for Poonarin. The Poonarin transmission line will cost only three rupees per kilowatt hour. So if we pay, if we buy, generate at Poonarin, say nine rupees, so we give another three rupees for the transmission line, 12 rupees. It's a pretty good price. So why not we give the transmission line financing also to the investor. So we have to think new business models. The traditional business model was always looking for ADB or World Bank or JICA. So I think we have to come out from there. We do need their support as well for the foreseeable future, but definitely we have to look at the business models. And in the distribution segment, to convert the distribution segment to smart grid, lot of work to be done. In the distribution segment, actually we do not have control centers. We do not have remote facilities. In the distribution, if a breaker trips, if something, some switch trips in the system, somebody has to go to there. Somebody has to take a vehicle, drive five kilometers, go to the switch and operate it. Except Colombo City, that is the status of the country. Nowhere in, in, in Sri Lanka except Colombo City, we have remote control facility for the distribution switches. I don't think we can go further like that. Definitely we should be able to control our distribution grid from one place, one control center. We should have SCADA facilities. So the distribution control centers are a must. So that is in the, in the roadmap to uh, converting distribution grid as a smart grid. And then we have to introduce smart meters because smart meters will play a huge role in managing the distribution entities, reducing losses, and will give a lot of added facilities for our customers. So smart metering is very important. That is also part of the journey towards converting the grid to a smart grid. Then the GIS systems, then the facilities to incorporate vehicles to our grid and many other things are to come 
to convert the existing uh, grid to a smart grid. So these are very essential in the reimagined distribution network. And then in the smart metering, we want to go on a roadmap. We want to convert all bulk supplies to smart meters. And we want to convert all important areas like Colombo City and important areas to smart meters. And each and every distribution transformer should be connected with the smart meter so that we can calculate the losses of the transformer remotely so that we know exactly what are the losses of this particular transform without which we cannot bring down the losses further. So we have to do a lot of things, a lot of new innovations and new technology should bring. The SCADA system should bring, the control centers should come for the distribution sector. So these projects will cost about 144 million that is for distribution developments and the smart uh, distribution projects will cost another 145 million US dollars. Actually, we have identified all the projects. Only thing is to look for finances and to implement those projects. Providing seamless digital customer experience, as I explained before, we have to give the digital services to the customers. Customer will become prosumer. And we have to introduce customer relationship management, innovative tariffs, demand response schemes, and so on. And in the business excellence, that is how we can improve efficiency and effectiveness within our organization. See, we is a large organization of 25,000 employees. It's one of the largest. So unless we properly manage our affairs, we cannot achieve these targets. We cannot achieve our goals. So we have to do a lot of improvements within ourselves to reach the business excellence. But that is a must. So there we have to do the business process re-engineering and to use information communication technology as much as possible. So by looking at all these important areas, we have prepared what is called roadmap for digital transformation of CEB. So that committee was headed by me and identified all the requirements that we have discussed to convert our utility to CEB to a digital utility and what projects we should bring to convert smart grids. And all these things have been identified in this book. And this book was approved by the Ministry Board of Directors and it is in the corporate plan of CEB as well. But unfortunately, the implementation of this is not up to the required levels. So we have to work very hard to all identify projects are there listed, we know the projects, but to implement those projects, we have to work hard, work very, very hard. Otherwise we cannot reach these things. And to bring this business excellence, this implementation of this uh, ERP project, the enterprise resource planning project, is very vital. So luckily, we spent one and a half years to design the enterprise resource planning project and identified all the requirements, all the functional requirements, and we went for a tender. Now the tender is in the final stage of evaluation. If we get the go-ahead, within one and a half years, within two years, we can finish this project. So that is also a very important project for the CEB. So during next uh, 10 years, so we have to do a lot of work to reimagine CEB. So a lot of work to be done and works have been identified and we have to look at different business models. So definitely all future power plants except one or two should be on built own and own operator and transfer model. The private sector should be encouraged to put up power plants. So that should be the business model. So the private sector can come and implement the power plants and we can buy. The LNG deployment will be completely on PPP model. That is the private sector. And certain transmission projects we can invite private sector to complete. And the distribution projects and the digital transformation projects as well. While we embark on all these things, we have to look at the tariff as well. Now, as I told you all before, from 2012, we have not changed our tariff. So I think it is time to think how we should change our tariff without affecting the industry, 
without affecting the poor people of this country. So when we compare our tariff against the uh, regional countries, we are in a lower level in industrial and the domestic. We are somewhere high level in the commercial sector. So we can do certain slight changes to the tariff to bring large revenues to the organization. That is also essential to bring the losses down of the CEB. CEB's losses are government losses. Ultimately, the, the losses are borne by the people of this country. So unless we properly manage our affairs and convert this organization to a viable, financially viable organization, ultimately people of this country will have to pay the price. So in conclusion, it is, CEB has come a long way. We have done a great service to the country. At present, we are doing a reasonably good service to our customers to the, and to the country, but stakeholders demand much more from us. So it is important to reimagine CEB. When we reimagine, we have to definitely go for, in the power generation sector, we have to go for low carbon technologies and renewable energy using appropriate business models. And we have to modernize the grid and we have to convert our grids to smart grids as early as possible. We have to give seamless digital ex uh, customer experience to our customers. We have to convert our organization to a business excellence by digital transformation. While all these things are also going, we have to do certain tariff revisions to make our organization viable. So this is a journey. It, it cannot be done within one or two days. It's a journey. So if all of us get together with the support of all stakeholders and all employees and the political leadership and the leadership of the ministry and others, if all are polarized towards our objectives, then we can achieve this. If we really work hard, we can achieve much during the next five years. So what we should do is to identify the areas of importance and look at the correct business models, get the proper blessings from stakeholders to implement those business models and go ahead and complete. I hope with the support of everybody, we should be able to achieve this challenge. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Engineer uh, Sinaviratna, for your lengthy but innovative, resourceful, and timely speech. You have shared a lot of statistics. Uh, also, you shared the strategies in my terms, how to resurrect or how to modernize the CEB, but in your terms, uh, how to reimagine the CEB. Thank you very much once again. Now I uh, finally call upon President-elect engineer KPIU Dharmapala to give away the token of appreciation to engineer Senavira. Thank you. To wind up the session, now I cordially invite engineer Chamil Lidirimuni, the sectional committee chairman of electrical, electronics, and telecommunication engineer, to deliver a giveaway. Thank you, CEO. Uh, before giving away the vote of thank, I as the electrical, electronics, and telecommunications external committee, we are very happy to see a large number of participants. So uh, that is what uh, we want as ISL as well. 
engineer KP QI Dharmapala, president elect the institution of engineer Sri Lanka, guest speaker, engineer Rohan Seniviratna, additional general manager, distribution division four of uh, Ceylon Electricity Board, past president, vice president, council members and members of IESF, family members of the late engineer Dr. Engineer DJ Vimalasudendra, engineer Priyamal, secretary of uh, electrical, electronics and telecommunication engineer section committee and engineer Roshan De Silva, uh, De deputy chairman of uh, our sectional committee and ladies and gentlemen first and foremost on behalf of the IESL let me thank engineer Rohan Seniratna for readily accepting our invitation and for being with us here today in, his, in spite of his busy schedule as our guest speaker to deliver this prestigious engineer DJ Vimal Surendra Memorial Lecture. He delivered this lecture because this is one of the main events of uh, IESL as we are conducting it annually. Moreover, we are indeed thankful to you for the selection of one of the most appropriate topic and giving insight into reimagining CB for the future which is to be discussed widely, meeting an increase in demand of electricity of the country with more reliable quality power supply at affordable price. Also, we really appreciate and we are so grateful for the family members of uh, late engineer doctor, engineer DJ Vimal Surendra for being with us on this Memorial Day. And we have distributed to the participants uh, the notebooks as the uh, sectional committee of uh, electrical, electronics, and telecommunication. You can just see what we have done throughout this uh, year, even though it has been affected with COVID-19 pandemic. And also, I would like to give you one notice. Uh, we will be uh, having a technical forum for because uh, as uh, engineer Rohan Seniratna also told that uh, we had a back, back out, recent back out in our system so that uh, we could we have to talk uh, about the technical aspects and some issues regard, relating to this back out. So as IESL, we are readily uh, uh, ready to coordinate with CB and all other stakeholders. Uh, we will be most probably within two weeks, we'll be conducting that technical forum. Also on behalf of electrical, electronic and telecommunication engineer sectional committee, I would like to thank the president, engineer professor Sarat Abeko, and executive secretary, engineer Neil Abe Sekara, and the secretariat staff for making this event a success. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, let me thank President-elect, past presidents, vice presidents, council members, invitees, and every one of you for taking your time to be with us, participating in this year's engineer DJ Vimrasarendra Memorial Oration. Thank you. <laughs>